Welcome you all back to another very relevant uh, Think Tech Hawaii show, Human Humane Architecture, broadcasting live from me here near, near Munich to Yuda Soto back in Honolulu, Hawaii. And we're having with us uh, Larry Stricker from his uh, gut cell vineyards in Napa Valley, California. Welcome back, Larry. Good to be here. <laughs> So uh, the, the question we're posing is that maybe the most promising potential for post-pandemic practices might actually to be found in the progressive path. We just put this out here as, as a question or as a manifest. So can we have the first slide up uh, to briefly recap where we had left in the volume one where you DeSoto and you Larry had shared interesting um, experiences from your project, Larry, which is the Mount Alani Bay Resort, which was built by, designed by you as a partner in the firm of Killingsworth, uh, Stricker and Lindgren Wilson and Associates. And uh, I found that picture that you said you had never seen before, which is in the, in the middle at the bottom, which is one of your exquisite wine bottles in front of an oak barrel, which, of course, you're using to uh, have the wine uh, age in gray. And uh, the material wood has puzzled us or, you know, caught our attention when you, uh, Larry, uh, were also showing us your photo documentation of when you were uh, attending your project uh, uh, the last time around the reopening after a uh, year or longer uh, renovation for the cost of $200 million. And can we get the second, the next slide up, please? And explain to us a little bit more what you saw when you were there and what you see here on the picture. Yeah, the, for the most part, the, the bones and the skeleton of the structure are the same. But in several areas, uh, with the introduction of wood, it has become a, a little heavy-handed. We'll see when we look at the original stairs, how they were handled. There's, there's, there's a lot more stairs, how it appears to be very monumental. And, and the functioning of the space has changed a little bit. I, I don't know that uh, uh, as we move to the further slides that shows the original, we can explain a little little better. But uh, absolutely, I've lost a lot of the lightness of the original stairway structure. Yeah, and we threw in a, a quote of a, the show we did with your friend and business partner, uh, Ron Lindgren, uh, and we were talking about the Marriott Palm Desert Hotel that you guys did where a similar thing had happened to that, that that beautiful, lush, tropical courtyard was um, erased and replaced with a rather generic corporate sort of hotel interior, very fortunate, very unfortunately. Luckily, uh, they did it with more style in your case. So from the aesthetics, they, you know, they stayed within uh, a decent language. But again, they might not have really understood um, Kind of the essence and the philosophy of um, your uh, your design strategy, which we will see. But why don't we go to the next slide? And now, I leave it up to DeSoto to explain what we see. Well, I would see that. Yeah, I, I think that we don't want to come across as being anti wood in general as we go through this discussion because the presence of wood in the remodeled hotel is very prominent. And I know, Martin, you're a big fan of the use of wood in construction. And there are a lot of reasons that wood is very good and very nice. It's a renewable resource. It has a lot of very nice qualities that people enjoy. You can do a lot of very interesting things with wood when you're constructing things. So we see here um, some evidence of the use of wood and the way that wood is merchandised and sold and promoted for architecture. So it's not a bad thing, but in this case, we're not 100% on board with what was done to it and with it in this particular situation. 
Yeah. So these are these are samples of the proof of evidence of us being woodpeckers, me and my family firm. And that being said, let's go to the next slide and um, and let's talk a little bit about that. So what what do we see and um, and what do we think about it, guys? Well, let's open this up for discussion. Well, the, I think the thing that, that you just said when we were rehearsing a few minutes ago that's really interesting is having seen the newly woodenized main stairway of the Monolani atrium, when you look at these two pictures of the guest rooms, which one of them is the original appearance and which one of them is the new remodeled appearance? And it may be deceptive because you'd think that, oh, they've just started this, you know, this massive use of wood. It must be the picture on the bottom with the wooden sliding shutter doors. But in fact, that's not the case, and Larry can tell us, I think, what what happened here, and what's which one is which. Well, definitely the the, the uh, view on top is the the new room, and the uh, I think I mentioned the the wear and tear on the wood louvers to restore them to their original uh, state or or to a a workable state what may have been cost prohibitive, but uh, there were also, I think the uh, the lower photo doesn't show, but the, the seating area nearest the, the lanai was also, uh, also had a coal wood floor, as, as did the entry. So the, the wood theme could have been carried throughout the, the guest room, but it, it may have, uh, again, been a a cost factor. Yeah, yeah and you were, the, you were saying that um, originally they, these wooden doors would have been oiled rather than painted or treated like that, and that would also potentially be another maintenance issue that they didn't want to have to deal with. Right. Yeah, and based on the uh, consultancy of our exotic escapism expert, Susanna, um, I want to point out these little quotes on the on the right side, which are from TripAdvisor or Yelp or something like that. Uh, they're from a little while ago before the renovation. The middle one says, dated, dark rooms. And so I think I'm afraid, uh, we're afraid that also it's the sort of aspect of novelty that seems to be uh, natural in an, a tragic way to the hotel industry that they think they have to do what they think their uh, their visitors, their tourists want. But the question is, you know, what was first, the chicken or the egg? And uh, so, again, we maybe we'll leave it with that and move on to the next. And Larry, explain to us what we see. We're, we're coming in at the entrance just from the Port Cochere. So we, we uh, this is... We have the, the blue tile and the fish ponds on either side of the entry separated uh, as a protective element, the, uh, the wood uh, seats and or benches, but it would also serve as a, a waiting area. And then you, you'll see the continuity of the blue tile and the, the water on either side of the entry carry through into the lobby and then down to the lower level. And I wanted to just interject here that even though the Manolani Hotel is in a tropical, on a tropical island in the Hawaiian Islands, it's actually the climate that it's located in is actually a desert. You're in the middle of a desert of lava. And it's kind of an oasis, obviously. It's a natural oasis there. But you're not in a highly humid, moist area. So the coolness, the apparent coolness of the blue tile and the shiny surface, I think, visually is a help to make you feel less hot in a hot environment. Yeah, and I'm actually the uh, contributor of these of these slides here, this one and the next couple ones, when I had a chance to be there uh, in 2013 uh, by the invitation of our uh, dean, the clerk of Willen at that time, who hired me, so thanks for all of that, Clark. And uh, I can, you know, just tell you guys how amazing it is to walk. As you got, as you, uh, Larry pointed out, these tiles are not even 
you know, each tile is different and you lay them in a way that you really allude to the notion of water. So it's like walking on water and, and this is very appropriate for uh, the tropics. And if we go to the next slide, um, we, uh, Larry, see us actually some more elements that all played and worked with each other here in a beautiful way. So we see the continuity of the blue tile carrying down the stairs to the floor of the atrium lobby, and then the waterfalls on either side of the stairs. And then the, uh, the very original design had a, a bar tucked in below the glass block that you see on the floor there with the blue tile. So that uh, had changed uh, with, with a, a later manager that, that felt the, the bar was, was uh, not positioned and, and as a result they, they had no, uh, no bar for a while. So it, it, uh, it was a, a strange, uh, un unfortunately uh, uh, the managers come and go and some of them don't bother to, to look at the history of certain elements. But, uh, yeah. And Larry, did and at night, for, was that floor illuminated from below by the bar underneath it? Right. Uh -huh. Just a, a soft glow. Of yeah, the, right, uh, right. The glass block and How fantastic. Blasted. But uh, it, I think it, uh, I think I'd like that. You, you said that the, the Japanese owner of the hotel didn't want to have the glass block be too easy to see through because it would have been indecent to look up the skirts of people, of women standing above. But I really actually liked the sandblasted texture of that, the kind of softness. I thought it looked really nice, even though it wasn't put mm -hmm. there just for aesthetics. Absolutely. So um, this is fantastic combination of, again, the sort of illusion of, of walking on water, on stained glass, on ceramic tiles, actual water. And go to the next slide. All these things together, the point you made, DeSoto, is that this, uh, we in Hawaii having 12 of the 14 climates in the world, and this being a desert climate, and in these days, when you would design something like that, you would have your environmental engineers. I just recall uh, Danish architects and, and Transalar Matthias Schuler working out concepts like that, where you basically, first of all, shade is key, and then you have natural ventilation, cross-ventilation, because as you pointed out, Larry, it's open on both sides. And then you do something that only works in our moderate uh, tropics and not unlike the uh, totally 100% humidity-saturated uh, subtropics, which is evaporative cooling, working to some degree. So this is perfect. This just 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 look look cool, but it actually makes you feel cool, literally and figuratively speaking. So and I think also in this slide you can see the the lightness and delicacy of the original stair, which kind of got lost when when the uh, the heavy handed wood came in and, and clad everything. Yeah, and and Larry, you originally designed sort of three levels, well, there's this multiple levels to this stairway, but the original stairway has got two stairs kind of going down, and then in the center, there's another level going down even further. So it's broken up into those different planes and different tilts and slants, but as you said, that's been eliminated, so now it's just one big expanse of wood-covered stairway that all just goes down. Right, rather than the three floating landing, right. there's the, the three stairs go right down into the atrium. Right, right. Yeah. So now it's more like a gun with a wind, Louisiana stair, yeah. right? <laughs> and way back, it, I picked this picture from, from online, the one on the left. The, I found a beautiful portraying that sort of lush, exotic, erotic, um, jungle lived in that courtyard, which was really wonderful. Again, and I had the chance and the honor and the luck to experience it myself. Next slide. Um, so the point we want to make is this is our PI mobile that you just sort of kindly take care of right now. 
and uh, Ron has been uh, shuttled in that, and that car is of the same time than uh, your project is, and uh, the kind of the sibling by by Ron and on a little the Halikolani, which we will have some uh, very fresh news to share at the end of the show. And uh, the point I want to make, we have been using cars as vehicles for thought for a while, this photo. Here our point is that actually my uh, paint is a little bit fading, is a little bit getting up in age, but I'm frequently asked, is this the original paint? Meaning if something is really a cult object, something vintage, the original condition matters, makes it the most valuable. Yes. So uh, the point is, again, um, uh, keep the original. And if you repainted a car, you can always bring back the original paint by painting it again, by bringing back the original. And that's what we actually want to urge and recommend to the uh, whoever is the owner. In the next uh, renovation, please bring back these tiles because they were beautiful and they make uh, up for the, the quality, uh, the fascinating exotic tropical lure so please bring this back and i was i was asking uh, beforehand since i am not an ex experienced in the realm of architecture or construction whether the wood had been perhaps just laid on top of the tile and the tile might be intact underneath for that to happen but both of you guys pointed out to me that no that is very unlikely the tile has probably been removed and Larry said that uh, later on, after in some later years, when they tried to reorder more tile of the same color and same kind of model texture, it was no longer available from the original manufacturer. So bringing it back would unfortunately not be as easy as I hoped it might be. Yeah. And aging uh, well and then um, applies to many things, like your great wine, for example that you produce and obviously to cars and to architecture and also to people and I guess this to the next slide and please um, explain to us when these pictures were were, were shot the, uh, the photo on the left was at the 30 year anniversary uh, party at the hotel at that time we uh, was doing some uh, planning for some some suites, the additional suites in the main building, and also some renovation to the uh, uh, various public areas. And then the the slide on the uh, right uh, was earlier this year at the uh, we we were there in January just after after the the uh, the new Alberge operation opened up and uh, got to got to see it you know fairly uh, during the first week of operation so it was uh, but we were there undercover and uh, not uh, oh, and not as not to give it any critique or anything any public critique rather but, yeah that uh, was that was something that I worried about whether people were coming up to you and asking you point blank well, what do you think of the renovation? Unfortunately, you weren't put in that situation of having to pass judgment on it. And I'll just say again, just like the total piece of artwork, uh, you guys are aging well and great, just like your work, just like your wine. So again, uh, and the more mature you get, uh, the more beautiful you get. So uh, that's how it is with good things and vintage things. That's right. So next slide. Um, this is a the video that we're referring to uh, in many times that Harvey Keller did with uh, your uh, former employer uh, and business partner and friend at Killingsworth, Larry, and he is uh, mentioning in this like a uh, half an hour or 45 minutes long a YouTube uh, interview, he mentions your project on minute six and is very proud of it. And he also manages, uh, mentions that four of the suites uh, rent out uh, for $4,500. And that video has been a while ago because, um, again, Ed um, died um, now some, some years ago. So, again, uh, it's vintage for that reason as well because it meant a lot uh, to Ed uh, as well, what you designed for the firm. And next slide. 
uh, another proof of evidence of how vintage it is is that um, Don Hibbert has included uh, your project with a pretty extensive coverage in his legendary book, Designing Paradise, as seen here. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And um, uh, this is uh, just illustrating uh, the title of the show that would be nicknamed um, pretty much Mount Alani Magic Mountain. And, and you had some pretty good points, uh, DeSoto, um, about the analogy of the two things we see. Why don't you share that? Well, I think people don't realize that uh, Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea, and that's the Mauna Kea is the mountain in this picture, are immensely large mountains. They don't look as tall as they really are because their slopes are so gentle. But Mauna, Mauna Kea, or Mauna Loa, is one of the, is the biggest mountain on Earth, taken from the floor of the ocean up to its peak. And in this picture, I think that the the lines of the hotel go very nicely with that very gentle slope in the background because the hotel is not just a vertical box, but in fact it has a slant to its exterior as well that I think kind of echoes that gentle slope that we see in the background. Absolutely. But there is more uh, as part of the resort that we don't want to miss out on uh, having Larry share with you. And let's go to the next slide. And this traces back to the, what you shared with us in the Volume 1 show about the cottages that the client was keen on. Right, Larry? Yeah, the, the cottages were, were Chairman Goto's desire. So five years after the hotel opened, we were able to open these five bungalows, which uh, were all identical in plan. And from the time they opened, there, there was always a waiting list, even at, at 4,500 a night. One of our first uh, clients was Kevin Costner. He was uh, in there for months uh, when he was shooting uh, what, that terrible movie, Waterworld. But, uh, uh, great. Uh, uh, we'll see in, in some of the additional slides how... Uh, Privacy was uh, utmost because we had a lot of high-end clients that would reserve these for weeks at a time, and uh, they're, they, they didn't necessarily mix with the other hotel guests. The, each cottage had a butler's kitchen, and the chef would come and prepare your meals, so you never had to leave the uh, leave the cottage at all. And I want to just point out when you said privacy for high-end guests. Kevin Costner, very notoriously during the production of the film Waterworld, had an affair with one of the women working on the film, probably within the confines of one of these bungalows. And let's go to the next slide. When you guys, before you guys get overexcited about that one, maybe yeah. one bad bungalow. <laughs> and if you guys would have told me that before, I would have, of course, made a slide for that. But now, you guys all. <laughs> Make it up in your mind. No, but no, here no, is the, uh, you know, in its architecture and language, obviously clearly distinctively different from uh, the hotel, which we have seen before. But I find it interesting that you imported this little gazebo that is clearly uh, uh, very killings worthy, and you placed it in front of the more double hip, dicky, roofy kind of bungalows. And I find this a very and by the way, we're talking mid '80s, so we're in the in the, in the peak of postmodernism, an era that hasn't produced the greatest architecture. But you guys just proved one can, and very much so. So thanks for that. Let's go to the next slide. Here's the floor plan. Um, explain to us very quickly, uh, Larry, how they were laid out. There were actually uh, two master suites with a, a living dining space in the center. And uh, the, uh, back when these were built, uh, Manalani uh, still sponsored the, the Skins game on the golf course. And we had uh, Gary Player stay in one of these, and he, he fell in love with them. And he, uh, he had us do a, a rendition of of this that he wanted to do in South Africa, only uh, two-story 
with the, the living space being a two-story space, and so a foursome could stay in this, this unit. So it was, uh, I don't know if they ever got built, but there's a, another, uh, uh, he was so taken with the, the beauty of these bungalows that uh, he wanted to do something similar, only be able to have, have four suites instead of just the two. Okay. And running out of time, we need to quickly jump over the next slide, which shows us the inside out um, uh, feel of, of the bungalows, and then go to the next slide, which is the final slide, which is another one of the finest uh, Carlos Denise illustrations of that situation, showing very clearly this sort of layering of the interior space, the pool, and then the pond, and then the ocean, which you described before. Um, uh, the, the news we're promising is that um, at the top left, it was just announced that uh, your partner, Ron Talikolani, built at the same time, is going for the same uh, big, huge renovation, and we'll certainly talk to Ron about that more. But I want to close on a note that I will uh, put up my new uh, Maui Gym sunglasses here uh, that I purchased, and um, it's night here. So I don't want to sing that, spare you on singing the song, uh, I wear my sunglasses at night. That's not the point. But the point is that I, where I picked these up, back in Honolulu, it came with this sort of uh, sales brochure. So they are, what you can see here is that they're selling these originating in Hawaii, sold all over the world, sunglasses, high-end sunglasses with a picture that looks very familiar to us because it's that same situation. These are the bungalows, and this is the Killingsworthy uh, Flying Beams gazebo. So one more proof of evidence, guys, that uh, Killingsworth is selling best, not just itself, but also sunglasses all over the world by keeping the Killingsworth and Larry's and Ron's work uh, in the original way. So with that, uh, we're at the end of Volume 2, but we have a Volume 3 with uh, having you back, Larry, actually for more shows, but one more for this one, because Ron has been digging out a fascinating brochure of another part of the project, the Manalani Groves, that I uh, scanned the, the document that he handed to me uh, kindly, and uh, we will have you uh, share that with us in the Volume 3. So... Until then, uh, stay all safe and sound and healthy and easy breezy and easy breezy. Thank you, guys, and see you in two weeks for that. Okay, bye. Okay, bye. Bye-bye.